Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally Famous for being 100% Kiwi owned. Call into one of the stores or visit online at tradedepot.co.nz. Hello and welcome to Generally Famous. I'm Simon Bridges and each week I'll be talking to generally famous but always interesting guests about life, love and what makes them tick. Foodie, muso, broadcaster, I think philosopher, I'm going to say that, philosopher king, Ganesh Raj, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. I mean, this is amazing sitting in front of you because not long ago you were sitting in front of me. This is right. And we were doing my podcast. But this is a bit like... um, Chicken and egg. Were you sitting in front of me or was I sitting in front of you? These are good questions. Uh, I'm not a macho guy, so I'm not going to kind of try and prove the point. But I feel, I feel like we are equals yes. at this table yes. uh, in Morningside uh, in, in Auckland. And um, you're right. So we met and we were talking on the po- podcast and you asked me something which I must confess, even though I didn't know you were going to ask me it, um, my death row meal, I, I had given a lot of thought to somehow, somewhere. In fact, I was going to put it in my book, um, but I ran out of space and I don't know, the editors didn't like and, and And I was talking like I was having a dozen oysters because if it's a death row yes. meal, I can because I'm not going to get gout from them. Dude, which your I list do was from, long. Yeah, I had Sauvignon Blanc um, with that. I then I then was on to a sorbet. I, I, maybe it was a... A peach ginger um, sorbet. And you then exposed I... the flaw in my plan that day. Oh, why is that? Because I didn't expect anyone to have a twelve course bloody meal. At the <laughs> I end. did. It was a degustation. It was. We had and I was like, listen, we had Fritz. Who the hell approved this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we had. We. I, I think we had cheeses. We had you did. fruits. <laughs> <laughs> we had sherry, we had dessert wine. You um, did, you b- did. Followed by port. It was a one. Oh it was God. a wonderful, sumptuous, extravagant <laughs> meal. Which meant that if it was death row, I was still alive for an out, like another twenty four hours at least, as they prepared the sumptuous and then the other delicious hour, meal. They pumped your stomach out because <laughs> you're in trouble. Oh, <laughs> don't ruin it. It's all right. It's all right. I'm going to be dead. Look, so it is it's, dead. It is dead. Um, but listen, we're not a trigger warning. Dead. Don't say that. Um, what would your um, Let's see, Death Row doesn't it? Desert Island, how's that? Desert Island, you know, you're there and it's sort of like your final meal. What would what would you be Hang on. eating? So, so tell me this. Desert Island mm. and I can have any resource I want to make this meal? Yes, we will make that a rule. I mean we're not I'm not gonna make you mm. catch the, the, the small fish with your hands. No, and, no. But this is know, gonna work now. Coconut leaves and so on. I mean you can don't do that, that if you no. Don't need that. No, I think what whatever you in principle, would like. I got you. All right, here we go. So my death row meal in that circumstance is two kinds of pig's part soup. Mm. So there's a... Pig's part. Soup. There's Mm. two kinds, right? In Singapore, there's two kinds. It comes from the Teochew people and the Hakka people, and they combine their forces. So two kinds. So on the island, there's all these pigs. Mm. That's all I really need, and Mm. some herbs and stuff, and, Mm. and... Maybe some rice so I can make my rice noodles from scratch. Mm, Wonderful. Um, So two types, braised pork, Mm. which will be braised in like a soy or a knife to plant soy and then ferment it. Sorry. Mm. Um, Braised pork. And then you're also braising all the insides, liver, lung, kidney, heart, gizzard, everything that Mm, that goes into that. You eat that with rice and you drizzle it over the top. That's part one. So there's like this. And it also has like a century egg, like a salted soy egg. So from the chickens, obviously, that are on the island. And then part two. Part two is like a more clear broth made with salted fermented vegetables. Mm. And then all the pork bones go into that. Mm. And that one cooks down. And then you also have only the large and small intestines and they float in that one. Mm. And that comes with a flat rice noodle with like a sesame oil and light soy dressing with uh, crispy shallots. There you go. Sounds amazing. And uh, uh, it makes me think of one thing, which is, am I right to say, and I certainly f- believe this of Chinese, but if we think about Asian food more generally, I mean, I, I remember Chinese friends saying to me, you know, you, 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 you like the boring parts of the animal. We like all the good, tasty parts. And you're talking to me about, I don't, I confess, I'm not even sure what a gizzard is, but <laughs> I, I, I don't mind a, a liver. Um, I mean, would this be, is this, would this be an Asian thing at a level to, to um, enjoy it all? I think this comes from Southeast a- like Southeast Asia, North Asia up towards China, not so much Japan. 
a little bit of Korea, mm. but mainly it's Southeast Asia where there's a real focus on eating the whole animal. Mm. And most people, and because all the food is street food mm. and it's been refined over the years and you'll find the same person or the same family cooking the same dish for like 40, 50 years in the same spot under a bridge somewhere. Amazing, eh? And so you get to know this type of food. And then when you look at other food, you start to wonder why we're not just doing that. And then, you know, it basically comes well, down actually, to education. But actually respectful to the animal, the respectful beast. Respectful to the animal, but also to, uh, learning how to do it all mm. so you can use bits and pieces over time. And, you know, I don't mean to preach on about bills and all that, but that's how you're built in Southeast Asia. You think about the money, yes. how much you spend on stuff. And that drives you to use every part of the animal. And then specialists arise through society over the years that make dishes using these things. And then voila, you have a culture that is built on that. And am I right to say you don't drink alcohol? No. Would you have a drink with this? I mean, are we talking about a refreshing coconut uh, juice or... Well, I would have sugarcane juice. Sugarcane. Freshly squeezed through the double rollers. The double stainless steel rollers, multiple squeezes mm. until every ounce has come out. Mm. Nice big container. Sounds beautiful. With some ice. <laughs> you, speaking of Southeast Asia, grew up in Singapore? Yes, I did. And um, tell me kind of about that. How did you, how was you, I mean, you look back, how do you feel about that growing up in Singapore? I mean, well, I suppose, you give me, having just asked you a question, let me explain. Let me tell you how you should feel. Um, when I think of Singapore, I've been there quite a few times and yeah. I love it. It's a little bit hot, uh, let's be honest, for yeah. a New Zealand sensibility. But, um, you know, it's a place, place of, and, and thinking about you as a foodie, I mean, it's a place of huge cultural fusion. And even, you know, says me as a former politician, think about their cabinet. They literally, down to the person, fuse the various cultures and ethnicities. I mean, well, yeah, how did you experience it growing up? I think in Singapore, when you, when 6% of the population are Indian, mm. you experience it as a minority. Mm. So I just wanted to say that out loud. 6%. La- yes. Mm. So I want to say that out loud so you understand the context of everything I say. And that that encompasses everything with opportunity um, and society and how society sees you. So I was fortunate. My mum is like a hardcore gangster as a woman. Right. And my dad was an a-hole. Mm. And he used to beat us. And she kicked him out of the house when we were five, nice. when I was five, because she was a gangster. Mm. And she did it to protect me, I guess. Mm. But w- no Indian woman in 1975 kicks her, wom- her, her husband out. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It just doesn't happen in the 70s. But You're like, very courageous, in fact. <sighs> Hardcore, man. Mm. She's so hardcore. So how old were you when that happened? Five. Um, right. Well, started at three, mm. and he was dumped by five. Mm. So it was just mum and I. And without sort of, um, you know, I don't, I don't mean to pry, but is he still uh, alive, your father? Or? Yo, want to hear a funny story? Mm. Here we go. I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. This is going to be dope. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, so it's kind of funny. Mm. Um, so we kicked him out. And I have two memories of him when he tried to come and revisit me when I was kind of six, maybe. Took me shopping. Referring back to your note about heat in Singapore, Mm. who buys a six-year-old a nylon bumblebee jumper? (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Who does that? Anyway, he did. Two nylon... (laughs) These are the weirdest memories, but these are kind of the memories I have. Nylon jumpers... And then drops me off at the old house that I used to live at. And my mom had like a sixth sense that he might do that. Bam, she shows up in a cab. There I am sitting on the culvert. Mm -hmm. Six-year-old with a bumblebee jumper. Mm -hmm. So for me, growing up with mom was amazing. Because basically what that made me was quite strong mentally. But the Mm -hmm. downside of that was she was a stone cold Steve Austin. She had to be, right? She built walls to protect herself from like... Family, society, hitting her with stuff. Here's mm. what you should do. She's like, no, I'm going to do this. So I became a bit of a no, I'm going to do this. Because it's carbon copy. Now, growing up in Singapore, that meant that as a teacher, she's a te- she was a teacher. Right. Like, I did really well at school. I don't even know how. But she would, like, feed me assessment papers in the evening. And all I had to do was finish it in half an hour and then I could go and play football. Mm. As long as I finished the paper, I could do anything I wanted. I didn't know that she was like preparing me for the final exams the whole time mm. in exchange for football. And then I like, aced my school. A bit like my children and iPads. 
I think that I think the football is better, but yeah, and and, and but you're right. And, and you're would right. you say that it was? I mean, hearing what you've said about your mother and your father, and 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 him having to be uh, kicked out, booted out. Um, part of me says, well, that wouldn't have been a happy childhood then. But it sounds to me like you're describing a happy childhood in Singapore growing up. Well, once I got to school. Like, and in like, a, well, I'm sorry, but in like tenement buildings, like I can imagine, no, you know, those mom sort of was, apartment buildings. No, mum was Singapore. a gangster. She bought a house in 1975 for 17 Gs wow. in Stinky, Singapore. <laughs> we call it Stinky. Um, yeah, and paid for it. Like, this is the thing, right? She... She was just punching above her weight. Byproduct was, you know, there was only two of us and we were carbon copies, right? Mm-hmm. That's what happens in that world. So and you were only child? Only child, only parent. That's my setup. How do you, without kind of turning into an amateur Sigmund Freud here, I mean, do you, only child in Singapore, Yeah. good, bad, Yeah. turned you into a weirdo. What do you reckon? Well, here's what it did do. At age 12, when I went to secondary school, I went to like one of those schools. I went to a place called Raffles Institution. Amazing. 1823. Sounds prestigious. Oldest school in Singapore and the top school. All the prime ministers and ministers. Lee Kuan Yew came out of that. Mm. It was that school. The beauty of that school was it cost 16 bucks a year and you got in off your grades. Right. Don't care where you came from. So you're a top student. At, at the primary school, yes. But here's the thing. That meant that at the school, there were like the gangster's son who had top grades and the geek's son that had top grades and the scientist's son that had top grades and the artist's son. All the kids, it was a boy's school too, and it was a rugby school. So we got rugby from an early year. So I played right through school. Got smashed 147 nil by Auckland Grammar when I was 14, just letting you know. <laughs> Stop laughing. What came over here? They came to us. Is that right? And we, we were watching them from the second floor, watching giant men, <laughs> boy men, eating meat and potatoes three times a day. And we were like noodles slurping. <laughs> I was a tight head prop, bro, I mean, 75 I kilos. I don't want to be mean. Hey, don't laugh. Why are you all laughing at me well, when I say... I, I don't want to be mean, I'm but really I, I, I mean, you know, when you watch the Olympics Guys. and the Commonwealth Games and these things... All shapes so, and Singapore, sizes. Uh, uh, Singapore wins like half a medal every year, right? <laughs> know, it's like, it's, hang on. Know, literally, I hate to say... No, no, here's it, the best is part. Is it ping pong? I feel yeah, like yeah, it's but we import... We, they paid for the ping pong Chinese person to move to Singapore and change passports. And guess what? They got a gold medal. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> right? They literally are so good at that. But anyway, so school, because um, mom kind of washed her hands of me when I hit 13 because I became a handful. And, and basically I lived with a pack of rats outside of school. My, my friends, we all lived at school. We hung out together. We only went home to eat. Everything I learned, I learned from sport at school, team. At age 45, I got a phone call that, my, that this person had died. He was a, a rugby coach for us. And he was a rugby coach at our school for almost 17 years. And I started to cry immediately as I heard my boy from Singapore telling me this. Cause, and then I was like, what is going on? And then we all realized that this dude was our dad. We all had, like, all of us in the sporting team, because we were all like, you know, at school all the time, we didn't really have a father figure mm. properly. This dude was our dad. Mm. So I show up for the funeral. There's 127 of us from four generations that this dude was our dad. The male influence that you needed and you got through that coach, through sport. Coach, literally yeah. coach. Fantastic. Hey, speaking of your school, Raffles Institution. I like it. Um, was, that a, was that a boarding school type lunch scenario or you bring your own picked whatever you bring? What, what are you eating for lunch? I mean, this is 1983, mm-hmm. right? It's a canteen. Two dollars, you can get uh, coconut rice with uh, fried eggplant and fried anchovies and a sambal with a little fried fish. And but that sounds pretty good. It is, but a bowl of noodles was thirty cents. Became fifty and then became a dollar. So relative, yes, relative, right? Food was at the tuck shop. You ate what you got at the tuck shop. You got a little bit of spending money to do the tuck shop thing and whatever else you needed. You better hustle or get some work. Work wasn't common back then. Earliest food memories. Earliest what do you? What, I, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm trying to struggle to think what I can think, but but what what, what when you think about being really yeah. young yeah. in Singapore with your ma, yeah. what are you eating? Well, it's a dish from a primary school canteen from when I was about four or five. It's called mirubus. It's a Malay dish. It's like quite a thick, saucy coconut coriander, cumin, turmeric thing 
with spring onions and um, bean sprouts, and it's like a yellow noodle, the kind you know. We all know the yellow noodle. Mm-hmm. It's got a little egg. Sometimes you have fish cake on it. Mm-hmm. It's a Malay dish, and it came off that little... I can just see myself grabbing it. I was probably, I don't know, eight. Yeah. Mirabo's 20 cents. Yeah. That's my earliest. And th- good? Dude, you can't get away with bad. So here's the thing in Singapore, right? People are always like, Hey, uh, where should I eat in Singapore, Ganesh? What restaurant should I go to? And I'm like, yo, I don't know. I don't go to restaurants. I just go to the street and eat only the street stuff. Yeah, because, that's fantastic. Because on, to, to, to have a following in Singapore on the street, you have to be good. Mm. Like the big food courts in the, big, you know, in, in the Chinatown areas or in, in downtown Singapore, those mm. big food courts, the rent in there is so exorbitant. So only the best can go in there to draw the crowd, the crowds, yeah. to pay yeah. the bill. And, and I've been to those, like in Singapore, to those sort of, um, it's, it's not in a mall or indoors, but it's sort of like, I want to say, outdoor, vibe, right? indoor, outdoor yeah, kind of yeah. car, car park or totally. something. Maybe it's a sort of a half, and, and, and you've got all those sort of almost caravans and so on. I mean, we, we now have a bit of that vibe going on in New a Zealand, little bit, but a little not, bit. not like that We're not fantastic there. food. Yeah. I'm thinking chili crab and chili crabs all of up these there. amazing Chili crabs up of, there. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm working on a, I'm going back to see my mum for the first time in three years in July, mm. and I'm actually going to plot. She's in Singapore. She lives in mm. Singapore. And I'm going to see her for the first time in three years, which is, you know, heartbreaking slash wonderful. You close to your mum? Let's put it this way. Over the last 10 years, I have actively worked to build a proper bridge with her mm. in a way that she doesn't have to work too hard. Because mm. I kind of realized that unless I put the work in, I'm never going to build that bridge. And she's not going to put it in. She's too far gone. Mm. So I have to be the kind of patient one, suck up some of the shit. And it's worked. Mm. We now say, I love you. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. And that wasn't happening before. Dude, I think it's only been happening for like a year now. I sometimes she's 82. I think, and with my mum, my mum's about the same, about 82, 83, and we're roughly, I think you're slightly older, old man. Um, but, it, it, you know... It, it, and the different circumstances, but a dad who was, look, he was not a bad guy. You know, it sounds different to your experience, but he was a bit useless. And so a mum, six kids, not one, but, you know, your situation, mm-hmm. mum alone with you, working hard at it. And so some of that other stuff goes by the wayside, the soft stuff, the yeah. the nice stuff. You, um, it, it strikes me, listening to you and what I know of you, that c- cooking and children um, – and those things together are incredibly important to you. I mean, if I think about my experience of cooking, not cooking children, cooking with ch- yes, that's illegal, by the way. Trigger warning, don't do that. Um, <laughs> cooking with children. I think of my two, I have three children, but I think of the two oldest, Emlyn and Harry, who are 10 and 8. It becomes a competition between them because I'm not comf- confident. Yes. I was going to say competent either, but, uh, you, you know, it's a stressful experience, right? I feel like it's good. Oh. And if you look at the Instagram pics of me and them cooking, you know, you'd probably think it looks joyful. Well, it's not. Right, it's awful. But you, you, you would say, I think, am I right, that this is important, that there's something about it that's, um, that's you know, really deeply good. Am I putting words into your no, mouth? No, you're not. Because here's what's interesting. I think I was talking to your producer earlier on. Season three of Ewell for Less is about to go to air. Mm. And we've learned recently through research that 8 to 14-year-olds love us and make their parents watch the show yeah. with them. Yeah. So that is basically the start of that seed that you just talked about, mm. spending time together, learning something together. It doesn't have to play out straight away. It's just this intrinsic relationship you're now building around food where you're watching a show about food. And it's not just about food. It's about cost and all that. It's not, it's yes. not a competition show. Yes. It's home economics. It's home economics, 100%. It. It's yeah. home economics on telly with a bit of entertainment. That you can all, and what's happening there is that that's our secret plan eating together, cooking together. Mm. And if the kiddies start, dude. It's very important. Well, what is important to me, and I'm a foodie in as much as I like it, and we do our eat out a lot actually as a family. And, and I suppose, you know, whilst, um, you know, I'm not necessarily there in the day and da 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 da, 
what we do do religiously is come together over food and we make sure there's I remember you said no that. devices and da 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 Weren't so you in really charge important. of ringing the bell at home? I was at home. It, it, to get the, in this rabbit warren we lived at immense, <laughs> there's an old-fashioned word that about eight people still remember. I remember that. But the church house, I would r- r- run around with this <laughs> shitty bell um, with, a, with, a, with a sort of a tie and a key ringing between the and, and get everyone for I did um, not expect that. When you said that, no. I was like, wow. Yeah, no, I West Auckland... <laughs> Gloria Avenue, uh, Teatatu North, as it was then. Do you um, something? Like, so, and another thing we do actually, and um, it's not all about me, but it is. No, it's not. Um, another thing we do is, and I say we, I don't actually because I hate them, but I want you to persuade me. <laughs> so you have me nothing otherwise. to do with what you're no, about I to do. say. Well, I sit there you watching. Have nothing to I do. sit there watching them watching <laughs> these reality cooking contests, right? And I could reel off. Actually, one I didn't mind was School of Chocolate. I don't know if you've seen that on no. Netflix. Very good, great French skilled guy. But, you know, there's Nadia, there's Jamie Oliver, there's Cake Boss, there's um, Gordon Ramsay, and there's there's a host of others. And I see there's all the Kiwi ones. Um, do you trash or valuable these shows? I don't care. <laughs> it's whatever you want. Honestly, yeah. I don't care. This is very sort of your truth is... Your truth. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I don't care. If that's what you like, enjoy. You know, because the well, truth. they do like. Great. There's no doubt about Great. that. And, you Natalie, know. and Natalie, my wife, tries to uh, involve me. I just, the selfish gene within me <laughs> finds it very <laughs> difficult to sit down and watch some douchebags. Well, that's you. So, and, competing over a look, beautiful cake. Is it, what is it? Is it cake or real, right? That's the other one I, I watch. Have you seen this? You no, deep, it's a freaking by the way, handbag. Um, you are very deep right now into this. Uh, you're, you're naming shows that no one's heard of right now. Oh, there, there are a lot on Netflix. I mean, there are like 89,000. I mean, it's just cheap TV. I, I, I would make the case that it is somewhat trashy. What is more value what I do like, and it's a tragedy unless someone corrects me, but I think I'm right. There is no food TV channel uh, any any more that you can get on Sky at least, but I liked that. I liked people there, you know, from Julia Childs through yeah. to you know that actually showing you something. As you digress, we, we need to move on because no, 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 Floyd on fish. Do you know this? I one? do. I know all those it was shows more because wine than fish. But. Totally, it was more wine than fish. But look, food education because that's what you're basically saying. Mm. Those were home economic style mm. learning with a bit of entertainment, right? That's mm. what you got out of that. And I think that's the most important thing that we need to get back to now is some way of... Now, all those shows won't work anymore. They won't work anymore for the current generation because there's no interest. They're not fast enough. No, the, the recipes aren't on TikTok and the recipes don't have a link to YouTube, which you can watch whenever you watch. And that's kind of how young people consume recipes right now. So how do you make what you do? And I, lo- I, I put it, it on TikTok and I make sure that it's sent... So the Humble Yum Yum is on TikTok as well as... I do. I follow the path. And your, and your TV show... Um, I mean, just on that, an education of not just children, actually all New Zealanders, and you you couldn't be more topical in terms of we are, and I think every politician, at, at least in theory, agrees a, co- a cost of living crisis hashtag. I mean, what are some of your without sort of getting spending ninety eight minutes on it? What 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 would you as general propositions? Um, how does a struggling Fano in New Zealand today ensure they're eating well for the same or less? The, no pressure. No I mean, pressure. It's, it's no a pre- very small issue. No pressure. Well, look, if we constantly imagine that everything I say includes a, a thought for money mm-hmm. and a thought for flavor, mm-hmm. let's assume that, okay? Mm-hmm. So if I have a limited budget, then the number one thing I have to do is to plot a few meals. Those meals I need to go and fit my budget, but also have leftovers for me to take to work or have something for the kids. Yeah. Now, I'm a busy human. I'm not going to be able to do everything all the time. So I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself. I'm only going to plan for three days. And then I'm going to start again. And maybe I'll get the family involved on a Wednesday to figure out what to do. Or maybe I'll start the Wednesday, finish on the Saturday, and then use the Sunday to figure out what to do from the Monday to the Wednesday. All I'm saying is there's a bit of work that anyone can do that is free work. Mm. You just have to put in some time to do Mm. that. The second thing is education. So it doesn't matter how you budget and plan 
if you if the list of the things that you, oh yeah sorry of course always have a list always have a list it's like a non-negotiable mm. right list is non-negotiable otherwise you end up with stupid stuff in your shopping trolley dude you know it and that's why budget stupid expenses hundred percent and right now with the with the way things are costing which is an absolute can you know is is horrible right now the way people are having to live and not being able to afford stuff so you have to make a list plan for the short term. And definitely get some education because the only way for you to be able to pick out stuff that's cheap or cheaper and use it in a way that's delicious so your family's happy is for you to know what to do with it, right? If you don't know what to do with something, how are you going to do that? So there's a ton of stuff. Like the humble yum yum is 20 bucks for four people. There's 62 recipes already. And they're from Asia because we learn how to do that over there. Mm. So the idea is education will take your money and help you feel better about what you do with it for your family's food. Mm. That's the idea. Uh, it's, it always struck me as a little bit corny, but in the end it's very true that, you know, give someone a, a meal, um, teach them how to fish, and uh, that's what you're saying to us quite deeply. You know, you can always count on the team at Trade Depot. There's a lot of things I really like about Trade Demo. One of them is that it's 100% Kiwi owned. As a proud Kiwi myself, that's really important to me. It makes a difference to me when I'm thinking about what I purchase. The other thing I love is that it stocks more than 4,500 top quality home improvement products. That's a huge range to choose from. And I know for Natalie and I, as we've moved from Tauranga to Auckland, and we've been looking around for a dryer, there is a huge range of products at fantastic prices. That's the third thing I love. Low prices always. It's New Zealand's largest online home improvement store. There's free delivery with minimum spends for Auckland, Hamilton and Christchurch. T's and C's apply. Check out tradedepot.co.nz or call into one of their three stores in Auckland, Christchurch and the new superstore in Hamilton near the airport. Look, in addition to being a foodie, and we, we've talked a bit about that, and we might come back to it because it is, you know, my top three or four topics of all, all time, and it's important. Um, you're and you a, are the degustation death row. Well, I am. I am. I am, as my body attests. Um, you're a muso. You're a broadcaster. I think, I, I don't want to sound like a stalker. I didn't spend that long on Google over you, but you um, you were sort of MTV Asia broadcaster or something. This, this sounds very glamorous. Look, it's not, it's not glamorous, right? This is basically my constant need to learn new stuff and not minding if I hit the ground and then I just get back up. And, try and are you again. school of life? Or are 100%. You, are you, 100%. As a foodie, do you ever done a chefing course or anything like that? I would never do it. I don't want the restrictions. Right. I don't want the restrictions of, not, of, of education around food. Oh, my God, can you imagine being restricted around food? There's a whole planet of food mm. cooked by people that have never learned in a school. Mm. They cook the best food in the world. What is Jamie Oliver? It's the nonnas, is it? You know, the, 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 the grandmas sitting there Dude. in southern Italy making anyway, the most Anyway, the nonnas in Tonga. The, most, the, yeah. the nonnas in yeah. Brazil. Like, what, yeah. Forget about it. Nonnas and, everywhere. And if you're smart enough, the papas inside. Yes. We've also learned a thing or two along the yes. way, hopefully. But yeah, for me, it's all about the fact that that's how the world works. This sort of career, career trajectory of yours, um, would you do it all again? Yes, yeah. 100%. Like for me personally, like I went to study music, right? That was my first port of call. It's and like, tell me, when we say music, what are we talking? What are you? I, you're sort of a celebrity DJ or something. I've got you at Ibiza with kind of party pills <laughs> in one pocket, kind of... Um, <laughs> I, I have my again what? because Listen, I am because don't I try am an experienced and live your fantasies. I have out. my hands up in the air right now. Hey? Hands up in the air. This is very hard for you me, just everyone. Don't I care. want you to all know that I'm going to need help after <laughs> the session. No, but look, the the thing I learned at a young age. So hey, you're, you're doing this for free, buddy. Oh, I don't do, know what you. Oh no! You know, I've let you plug your podcast a couple of times. This is my podcast. Gen, I'm gen, sorry. Generally famous. Generally famous by Simon Bridges. <laughs> there you go. I did it for you. That's a tag. Um, When I was about 13, I fell in love with music production. So I started to love synthesizers and sequences. Well, that's not real music. Well, I knew also how. (laughs) I also luckily started. No, but luckily, my mother. I've offended you. I can tell. No, 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 no. I want to tell you the context. 
at six, she sent me to piano class, like every good Indian child did. And um, God bless her. But, you know, she was quite strict about it. So she picked like the strictest music teacher who used to hit me on the knuckles when I played wrong notes on the scales. You wouldn't get away with that today. No, you wouldn't. But I got to grade seven and then I purposefully pulled the pin to piss her off so she would not have the complete package. Mm. That's how... That's how rebellious things got. Nasty child. I know, I apologise. But the good news was I learned to play. So I could play. Then I got into production. Production meant that I loved gizmotrons, all the gizmos. So in sing- like, it's really expensive. All that stuff was really expensive when I was growing up, right? Key- keyboards were like 12 grand. Hmm. But I thought that if I worked in a music shop, I could exchange, let me play with all the instruments in exchange for helping you sell stuff. Hmm. So th- I did that for a year and a half which kept me around the equipment the whole time without having to own anything in exchange for helping the dude in the shop sell things. That got me interested in production of music as well. Right. That then led me to go, well, I'm going to go to audio engineering school. So that's what I did. I moved to Florida and I went to a school called Full Sail. You lived in a lot of countries. I have. How did we let you into New Zealand? Good We're question. Me through this. This is a good question. And how long have you been here? Don't tell anyone, but it's been 20 years. Wow. Yeah, 2002, right? Actually, I did know that. Weirdo. Google, <laughs> Wikipedia, Ganesh so, Raj Wikipedia page. So audio engineering was great. Nailed that and then travelled across America through like Tallahassee, Baton Rouge, being an intern at Country Music Studios. And basically that drove across Albuquerque. That was my last stop. And then moved back to Singapore, sold all the sequences and synthesizers, got five grand together and moved to London to be an audio engineer. Went there. Old days, my boys from school who all had brains at LSC and all those, (laughs) they were like, look, you can use our computer lab and make all the CVs here and print it for free and we'll post it for you. Because I was like the freak in the group. They were all like learning to be hedge fund managers and I was trying to be an audio engineer. But they loved me, thankfully. And then they all want to come back here and be a national MP. We're still best friends. <laughs> but the best part was I got to send out like CVs, hardcore, old yeah. school, and then phone up, old school, do you have a job, do you have a job? After three months, got an internship and then just started working at different places. And then that led me one day to get a job offer for a new studio that was being built. And it was basically like a a, a television studio with a production office and post-production up top. And I was going to be the head of sound for the production downstairs in the studio. And that's what I did. You mean any famous cats? I have, I have in the time. I have. What do you you want to know? Music people? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I love the most, it's the stupidest thing. But I'm like a massive Prince fan, okay? Mm, You're amazing. um, Artists formerly known as. Well, don't even say it, bro. You're going to make me cry. But he, so the studio that I worked at, two studios, and they had a live rehearsal space. And that space was very commonly used by bands that were touring. They would come into London, set up, rehearse while the tour manager was prepping the tour, as well as getting all the equipment moved forward, two stages, three stages to set up. But they would rehearse for a week in that in, next door. Amazing. And one day, it was Prince and the New Power Generation. Wow, amazing. And I got to take him a heater. Wow. Because it was hey, cold. You shouldn't have told you still met him. And though. I put it next to him. No, and I walked him. away. And till this day, it's the best part of my it's life. Amazing. I mean, he's short, right? <laughs> look, no, he's not. He's a freaking giant, bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I, I have a look. You know, <laughs> don't because, even ever hey, talk, hey, because don't talk to him. Is, don't talk about him like that. Because this is my podcast, <laughs> I also have a Prince story, buddy. Okay? All right? I'm listening. Here we go. I'm listening. My sister. Rachel, I'm giving you her name so that you know I'm not making this up. My sister Rachel's ex-American husband from Minnesota, where Prince is from, sister Heidi, was Prince's wardrobe manager. And um, and I, I, I cannot say I've ever met Prince, but as a... 11, 12-year-old, when we went to Minnesota, where my sister was at that point, aren't you? now in St. Helier's, Auckland, um, we went to see Heidi in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and she was there in one of her sort of wardrobe things with all his high heel boots no. and glitzy. Dinner. Yeah, because she was his, um, and so she knew him quite well. And that's um, that is amazing that, is that just, you got to see the outfits. Though. I did not intend to tell you that story today. No, but, but what know, a great story! Every because that good is dude, artist formerly known as Prince Story deserves listen, another. Listen, that is looking under the hood. 
You know what I mean? Like, you don't get those experiences. No, it was amazing. It's it like the right place, right you time. You saw him, but, you know, it's these things, you'd love to see him in concert, wouldn't you? I Absolutely. did. I've seen him twice. I wow. saw him at Wembley once on the Diamonds and Pearl store, and I was so lucky to oh, see him in the piano tour in town, like a month before and, he passed. And he plays like about 98 instruments, doesn't he? I mean, no, he's one of these. No, 198. Yeah. 198. Him and Stevie Wonder. Don't even go there, bro. There's no, there's mm. no comparison. There's no comparison between the two. You're dissing Stevie Wonder. I'm not dissing. I'm just saying there's no comparison. I mean, that's the headline we're going to take from this, right? Take Dinesh, it. Raj, disses Stevie Wonder. Done. Um, <laughs> are you a Kiwi now? There's no right or wrong answer to this. You don't need yeah, to yeah. say yes. You think you, 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 I'm nothing. I don't have a country. You're an international citizen. I don't you're think a man like of that. the world. I don't care. I really don't. Imagine all the people Where living my wife life as one. Where my wife there's and, no borders or whatever it is that John Lennon once said. Honest truth, where my wife and daughter are. Yeah. That's basically it. Joe, I don't obviously know, but she seems like a wonderful person Dude, and a rock Seriously, for, for me personally, cause I've lived in a few countries in my time and spent time in different places, six months here, one year there, mm-hmm. different projects. And the truth is I don't really, really care. As long as I feel good, my family's well, and I have a little bit of a purpose. And I think all the different countries I've lived in have educated me. And I think for that, I'm very grateful. Like travel is a getting to know people in different parts of the world and learning about food in different parts of the world is something I've always done. Do you think in about 20 years, you, Joe, and your cat, if you've got one, will be retiring to sort of Oriwa Beach or Tauranga sort of retirement village? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Is that? Do you see this in your future? No. Huh. Where do we go from there? <laughs> you were talking well-being, actually, just then. <laughs> did they see what I did there? I said, wait in. No, you're, I wanna, a good, you're a good broadcaster. No, well, you, yeah, well, I am a broadcaster. That's right. <laughs> Simon Bridges, former <laughs> member of parliament, businessman and broadcaster. Um, I, I want to say this. Look, if I'm wrong and I've got you unfairly here, you just say this. But I feel like in looking photos of you and my, you know how on Google you've got sort of the stories and then you go photos of, and it's got a word trao there. And you press that and it comes down and there's the photos of you. I feel like you were once fatter than you are now. Dude, no, absolutely. Seriously, once upon a time, different human, right? I discovered that the day I, when I stopped drinking... I made a conscious decision, and when I stopped that, and you're going to ask me why, so I'll give you the um, the. F- so you did drink. It's not something. That oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. The Cliff Notes version is, I was dusty all the time. Yeah. You know, you could start at 4 p.m. with a glass of wine, which led to another one as you started cooking, which led to another one by the time you finished cooking, which led to one more when you started eating. Mm. And then you just finish it. And that's no way to live. I'm describing a lot of people in this country, by the way. Yeah. Just letting you know that yeah. out loud. Yeah. Um, and that cannot be... So what I found was dustiness, you know, like a constant dustiness. And Indians have a propensity towards diabetes mm. and heart disease. Mm. That's our jam. There were two people in my family that had diabetes and I got tested and I was like pre-diabetic by one point which is all I really needed to kick me in the butt. And at that point, I was like, all right, bro. And what a butt it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. It was ginormous. I didn't look after myself for a long time. So once I stopped, um, I was able to reignite like my love of – like when I was at school time, I, like, I loved sport. I played sport competitively, and fitness was my dream sequence, and everybody I have around my life was like that. But, you know, I had to learn different things through life, and that's what happens. And I learned that I needed to go back to this version of health in order to kind of, you know, learn new things. How long are we talking now? What? Six years. So you don't drink. Uh, you, you, I understand intermittent fasting. Still doing it. What six, are we talking? Six years. And, and, and is this sort of day on, day off running no, through that? every day. Does, every day. So this is my... This is, is my through to dinner time or what's the... I won't make you pull, it, pull, pull teeth. I'll just give it to you. Yep. Here's, how, here's what I do. Um, so I, I, I intermittent fast every day from like, I eat between 12 and eight. That's my jam. Right. But I've been doing it for so long that it doesn't really matter. Absolutely sticking to it. My body knows something's coming or something's going. Yes. Right. Your body learns. Yes. Um, I make sure I sleep well. I used to take ZMA, zinc, magnesium tablets to make sure the sleep was solid. Um, I am in a caloric deficit every day because there's nothing that fix, you know, if you want to maintain, you got to put less in than you put out. Correct. Is mm. basic math. You can't like eat a lot and do less exercise and get a result. You have to do the opposite. 
result base. Result and you're sugar free. I was struggling. That was my greatest. That was my last last greatest struggle was like getting over the white sugar because I hadn't figured out how to reconcile it with the work that I was doing as well as my love to binge on it. Mm. So I got hypnosis. Wow. And hypnosis was incredible. You tell me, is it in all seriousness that that was a sort of a um, something went deep in your psyche? Get rid of the white sugar. Well, he, he, want to hear the hypnosis story? Because yeah. it's dope. Here's what happened. You sit in front of the hypnotist. He makes sure that you are committed to this process because if you're not mentally, then it ain't going to play out. So, yes, I am, of course. That's why I'm sitting before you. Then he says, all right, check this out. You. This are, is here in New Zealand. Yes, state, it is. Obvious. Yep. Yeah, I'm not going to say who, but no. th- this is what he told me. He said, you, here in Auckland. Here in Auckland. You are a wolf. You have to remain the alpha of your pack at all times. And at your feet are all these young wolves. And all they want to do is eat you and kill you and become the alpha. But only you can be the alpha. And in those little wolves, you plug in whatever you want. White sugar, gambling, alcohol. You plug in whatever you want. But those have to be kept at bay in all times. And that's up to you if you want to remain the alpha and sleep. 45 minutes go by. There's an MP3 of this file of the moment, of the 45 minutes. I've never listened to it before. And in my brain now, it is so entrenched that I have to remain the alpha of my pack. I got a tat on my left thigh, which, when I look in the mirror, reminds me. And now it's like the most... What's the tat say? It's a big wolf. I'll show it to you later on. Mm. But it reminds me, it's like my tool now of remaining the alpha of anything that I'm going through. And when this is being said, are you in a state of deep something? No, no, this was pre. You're deeply conscious... And then you go into a, That's a, right. a sort of a meditative sleep. I don't know what happened. 45 so, minutes. My concern, this is amazing, but my concern was, <laughs> I, I, I grew up in a very religious house. I, was, we, Mance, I mean, we, I think we were told that hypnosis was something of the devil and um, <laughs> you're now filled with demons and I can see them. No. I'll take but, that. I'll but, take that. But my, I love demons. My actual concern would more be handing over that control to the guy what if he puts in a couple of gremlins every time he says Gesundheit, you give him a thousand bucks? Hey, listen, if I'm entertaining like that, someone please let me know. Gesundheit. <laughs> no snap. Um, <laughs> Not working. I, the other thing in all seriousness on this, I mean, it's amazing to hear your journey on, on well-being and, you know, as I say, you look terrific. And, Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I mean that sincerely. I also understand you meditate. Yeah. Run me through that. So I started by meditating using an app that everyone knows about, like Headspace, right? We all know Headspace. So I started there. I loved the concept. So meditation for me started when I was quite young in a, quite a negative way. My grandfather, there is no time for us to talk about that. How much time do we have? Um, oh, we have time. A little bit, a little bit. We have a little time. Okay. God. The flip notes, the flip notes version again. Granddad was a Hindu religious leader. In mm-hmm. Singapore, mm-hmm. and I was his little pet, and basically it took me around. And this is your mother's father. My mother's did. father, and um, so you know, I played in a little Hindu religious group and 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 sung the songs and did all the stuff. Did meditation, but it was like a very forced version. So, because I rebelled against that, obviously, because that's kind of what I did. Meditation to me had a negative connotation for a very long time. I I, I just like couldn't settle into it. Then I found the headspace thing, and that kind of got me back into it, which I, that evolved. So now meditation for me is like an active meditation. I, I, the way I breathe when I do all my daily workouts is now the way that I fully refocus. So when you're exercising, yes, you also believe you're in a meditative state That's through, what your, I feel. through your breathing practices. That's what I feel. And how do you think this, how does it make you feel? I mean, as opposed to if you can describe to us the the pre or the non-state to, you know, what, what you're doing and what it means for your well-being. For me personally, when I have all that serotonin kick in and, and, and I feel good about what I've achieved for my health, I personally am able to be more patient and compassionate about challenges that hit me. Mm. That's what I'm finding. I, I, I'm more patient. I'm it's more fantastic. compassionate. I, I listen to myself a bit more. I'm not as, you know... Trigger happy, if you know, you know yes. what I mean. And I think I think we're all learning, aren't we, that it's important to have these, uh, whatever you want to call whatever them, you want to mechanisms. Call, totally, to, man. Answer me this final question. We've got to, do, we've do, got do, to do. move on do, to do, our do. final questions. 
Do you believe meditation for you is purely, um, let me use a fancy word, I think it's the right word in this context, physiological, that is a normal, natural thing for you? Or do you think there's something higher and spiritual to it that some believe there is? 100%. Of course there's a higher spirituality. Of course there is. Look at nature. Hmm. All you have to do is look at nature to understand that we know nothing and and there's so much out there. that You know what I mean? Nature will tell you that. Knowledge around nature will tell you that. Of course, there's a, there's a higher spiritual power. But I don't have names for it. No. I don't know what it looks like. I ask every guest three questions. It's our general knowledge section that involves no general knowledge. <laughs> um, and if your print story and some of the other ones you've told us are anything to go by, this is going to be a treat. Firstly, what single object, if you could take only one, would you save from your home? All the photos. Yeah. Printed photos. My wife and I have already decided this. If the house is going to burn down, we know where the photos are. You got photo albums? We have, no, like from the, whatever you've got from, from the, the past, past before mm. everything became before digital. Phones. But we do have a stack mm. and those have to be saved. It's actually somewhat a shame, isn't it? Because for me, the phones are, or the photos are all in this phone. Well, they're in the cloud. We have like 27,000 so. photos in the cloud from our yeah. home, thankfully for the yeah. cloud. But you're right. I'm from a generation, you're from a generation where the photo had a bit more significance. Yeah, the physically so, printed photo. So we keep those because that's all we've got mm. from our past. Mm, take those and run. No, it's fantastic. Secondly, what is the best night out that you have ever had? So the missus and I were in LA and we were at the standard on Sunset across the road from the comedy store. And we went over one night to watch comedy because, you know, it's the most amazing place. And I don't know who knows, like there's a comedian called Eddie Griffin and he's very, very funny. He's from the Martin Lawrence period mm-hmm. and a little bit of Dice Clay period, um, pre-Chris Tucker period. So he did like a three-hour set and we sat there till 3 a.m., him just the most incredible comedy. And then we went back the next night and then Eddie Griffin came back up, but we made friends with the waitress by then, who then came and tapped our shoulder and said, why don't you come to the private room? And then we went over, and it was Paul Mooney's birthday, Eddie Murphy's writer. Mm. And Eddie Murphy and all the boys were sitting at the table like two doors from me over wow. there, cackling away. And then we went to the car park to listen to them talk crap, and I didn't have the balls to go and say hello because I was so starstruck. <laughs> so Eddie Murphy was Eddie there. Murphy, Andrew Dice Clay... Eddie Griffin, Paul Mooney, all in the car park, wow. and I'm just eavesdropping. Wow. <laughs> you love li- live comedy? More than so many things. I mean, you're, a, and I'm not, it's, it sounds a silly thing. You're a funny guy. I mean, do you, do you, what do you think comedy, I think we need it, don't we? 100%. I mean, I think um, It's freedom, dude. It's freedom. Yeah. Comedy is freedom. What do you make of this debate at the moment? I was talking with someone else about this. I, I don't know. I mean, we, we, live in, we, li- we live in gentler times at one level where, you know, people are sensitive about other people's thoughts and needs. But, you know, you've got a situation where comedians are, in quotes, getting cancelled. You've got um, Ricky Gervais on a Netflix series and yeah. people are uproarious. What do you, what do you sort of make of all of that? I think we're going through a period of reckoning mm. because it's been too loose for too long. Right. It has. It has been too loose. If you go and listen to the jokes of all Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy and stuff, there's so much stuff that when I grew up I thought was incredibly funny, but I never really paid attention to how offensive it would have been to the people who he was talking about. So there's a period of reckoning. That's where we're at. But it will come back. It's, but, you know, it had to reckon, right? It had to reckon, and then it will re, re, it'll come back to whatever that is. When my daughter, who is now 17, is 24 or 29, there will be a settlement of whatever this is. You and I will be bystanders. Mm, I don't know that I'll ever be asked up to do a comedy routine. You never know. You never know. Maybe that's what they'll call this. Um, actually, I, you know, we know we won't get there. I had, I had another story, but we won't go there. What is the best advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? So there's the, I don't have a who gave it to you part. I've just like sucked philosophy from different places. Mm. But there's acronyms that I really like, like, the word fail means first attempt in learning. Mm. The word end means effort never dies. Mm. The word no means next opportunity. Mm. So if you're asking me what my mantras are, that's it right there. I think that first one's, um, you know, particularly good. People, the, 
you, you know, Richard Nixon is a failed president, but he did say one thing I thought was amazing, which is, you know, look, you, you, you don't know the um, the mountaintops unless you've had the valleys. All day. And I certainly know that to be uh, true. Well, you know, Ganesha, it's been fantastic to have you today. We've heard about Prince. We've heard about nonas around the world. We've oh had food tips. We've uh, we've done it all. Eddie Murphy, it's all been there. Thank you so much for coming Thank you so on, much for having famous. me. All the best of the podcast. You've been listening to Generally Famous. There are more episodes at stuff.co.nz slash generally famous and wherever you get your podcasts. If you follow us on any of the podcast apps, you'll get instant access to the next episode. It's quick and easy to do. Thanks very much to producer Chris Reed. I'm Simon Bridges and this is Generally Famous. It's been great to have you along. Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for low prices, always.